Yes, of course, I know my name is Jasmine. And today I just kind of want to talk to you guys that today about the idea of um, taking up space. And what I mean by that is just by uh, bringing your full identity to whatever space you're in. And you know, that space could be school, it could be work, it could be, I don't know, your family, daycare, anything like just whatever spaces you inhabit. I think it's important to bring your full identity there. And when I think about that, I just feel like, you know, it's like having ingredients to a cake, like eggs, sugar, flour, whatever. You need all those things to mix it up to get the actual end result, to get that cake. And you need all the pieces of you to be you. So if you're ever in a space where you can't bring portions of yourself, then I like highly encourage you not to be there or to make that like, to kind of stretch it out and like stretch the boundaries of that space you're in. Um, so for me, I, I'm obviously more than all these different circles around here, but a few of them I'd like to point out are, well, I'm a mother, I'm an athlete, I'm a feminist, I love foods, I'm a foodie, I'm Black, I'm relatively young, at least I think so, um, and I'm a DIYer, and so for me, that's been important, especially when I've come into the workplace about being a mother, like, you know, what um, what stuff do they have there that will help me with childcare? Or is there um, PTO? Uh, is there PTO something that's like flexible, something I can use? Do they have flexible spending accounts? And that's just like something I point out because I know that a lot of women have had difficulty throughout this pandemic even keeping their job. And we can see women leaving the workforce just by the thousands. I'm sure the number is like even higher than that. Um, but that's because those spaces aren't allowing them to be mothers and to work. Um, so my question for you guys is, you know, what are some things that make you you? Like, what are the things that if someone asks you, like who you are, what you do, what matters to you, you know, what would those things be? So I'd love for y'all to drop a few of those things in the chat and take a few minutes for that. It might take some time, so feel free to just slowly push them in the chat and I will keep talking. Um, but yeah, so for me, I'm kind of going back way, way back into 2009. It seems like yesterday to me, but obviously it was like 12 years ago. Um, I define myself a lot by like athletics. So I ran track at Georgia Tech and that was like maybe one of the biggest things that mattered to me, like whatever I did had to include sports. So my major was architecture. So I just decided that, well, I'm gonna major in architecture and I'm gonna make sports stadiums. Like that's all that I'm gonna do. Anything that revolves around that, like Olympic stadiums, that's what I want to do. And honestly, I have never really shown this to anyone, <laughs> but I wasn't that good at architecture. I'm not gonna lie, I didn't feel like I was. This might be the best rendering I got out of those four years <laughs> that I was doing architecture. Um, and looking back at it, I was like, you know, wondering what is the issue? What for me, like what made me not super successful at this? And I think initially is because I didn't define myself as a creative person. Like I never did any art classes. I didn't draw anything in high school. Nothing led me to doing a creative degree besides just my gut feeling because I wanted to. Um, and I'm glad I followed it, but I also had like a lot of struggle because what I needed more so was to learn the tools to help me to visualize. Like I needed to learn how to draw. I needed to learn how to render. I needed to learn what it was like to walk through space and to map that out and to see what it could feel like. Um, so it's funny cause I like was wondering what I should show. And a lot of times in presentations, I show the best thing that I have just like, you know, we all would, but today I'm kind of showing the worst things that I have just to share. <laughs> um, but also, one of the things I love the most was actually that I learned from architecture was really like creating models and making things physically. So this is like the Schroeder house that I was super proud of. We just made like a model of it. Um, I think three of us, but I probably put in like, you know, 80% of the work because you know how group projects go. Um, <laughs> but I enjoyed it the most because I really enjoyed working with, well, this is MDF, it's not wood, but MDF and some basswood and putting things together, I really learned that I enjoyed craft and creating things like physical, physical, tangible things I could hold in my hand or whatever. 
and I can't really hold a building in my hands. So maybe that was why I couldn't really grasp architecture. I don't know. Um, but that was something that I learned. And this was, this is actually my first ever uh, sketch. So <laughs> in industrial design. So the first year I came to Georgia Tech, they had us do a common first year class so we could learn about all the design disciplines. So they had within the College of Architecture at Georgia Tech, they had architecture, industrial design, and building construction. And I think they knew that most people weren't really introduced to these things during high school. And so they made the whole first year about being introduced to all that stuff. And so this was when I was introduced to industrial design. And this is my first ever sketch of, you know, a beautiful egg beater. <laughs> and for me, I was like, wow, how amazing. Like, I never knew I could even draw. <laughs> and it made me feel so empowered. But like I said before, I didn't really define myself as a creative person. I didn't feel like that was a part of my identity. It wasn't part of my circles. It wasn't my, one of my ingredients to my cake called Jasmine. And so I kind of didn't go in that direction. But after, um, after this first year, I went to architecture. I did that for two years. Then I decided that I <laughs> wasn't interested in architecture and that I felt like I wasn't succeeding um, for all the reasons that I shared before. And I went back into industrial design and took more and more sketching classes. Um, and this is actually like my final, one of my final sketches from an advanced design sketching class we had. So that was like probably the second time I decided to actually draw in my life outside of like, you know, um, elevations and floor pans and stuff like this is me drawing in perspective and making my own idea for a kid's camera that I thought could be fun. It was called the hoot shoot. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you can see the little flash and the owl's eyebrow and the Polaroid would come out this way. Who knows if that would really work in real life, but that was kind of my idea. And so I found that like, okay, I'm very empowered by like being able to draw and like learning how to draw. And then also by creating like my own ideas for things that I find fun or things that I feel like, you know, resonate with me. And it's funny because, well, I finally got to, this is me at the end of like, at the beginning of 2013. Um, in May, 2013, I ended up graduating college. So I was like, well, what did I do? What did I even learn? I'm getting a bachelor's in architecture. I just decided I'm not interested in it and I want to start and get better at something else. Like, what did I really get out of this? Like, did I waste all my time? So I, looking back, I feel like it was me failing forward because obviously at the time, who knows, who would have known that I would, you know, create a career in industrial design. I thought that I was just not following through in architecture. But my question, you know, for you guys, which obviously take your time to put it in the chat is, you know, what ways have you failed forward? that you may not know right now? Or what ways, or what um, things can you kind of put in perspective as like, you know, this felt like a failure, it felt like I wasn't successful, but it still has pushed me forward. So, you know, think of that and put it in the chat. Oh, I'm seeing some really cool um, ingredients to you guys, mother, designer, writer, educator, mm, aunt, sister, athlete, <laughs> they didn't make me create a chair first, no, because I wasn't in industrial design studio, but everyone in industrial design studio did make a chair first. So that's such a funny question. Oh, curious cat. I like that. Voracious consumer of all things words. I love all these things y'all are interested in. But either way, um, I guess reflect in a little bit and try and see, you know, what ways have you failed forward possibly? Um, so after I failed forward, <laughs> I started thinking a little bit like, what did I learn? Because I want to make sure that I get something from this experience. And I, it made me kind of go back to the theory of multiple intelligence by Howard Gardner. Um, and I was introduced to this by um, a colleague. And it was talking about all the, all the ways in which we learn. So naturalistic, musical, logical, um, all these areas are ways that we can learn. And I think one thing that I learned through my bachelor's was really just learning um, how to visualize the world in 3D. So that spatial area I felt was really important for me. And there was an area I had never tapped into. So I had to give myself a little bit of grace, like, you know, maybe my timeline will be longer than someone else's, but at least, you know, I know that I feel empowered learning the world, learning how to visualize the world in 3D. And I know that that's a place that I find like a lot of energy and a lot of fun. 
Um, I feel like at least in high school for me, I did a lot of the logical area, like, you know, quantifying stuff. <laughs> but when I did get into the creative area, I feel like it was spatial, it was interpersonal, like even learning about people and their needs. Um, it also got interpersonal, kind of understanding my feelings and my wants, because that's kind of what design gave me. It helped me discover another aspect of myself that I didn't know was there. So I hope that, you know, in design, I know everyone wants to create amazing things, but I also hope that, you know, it's a pathway for you to learn about yourself as you go through your journey and your career. Um, later in life, I think I get to the existential portion. <laughs> But at least the four things I'd say that I learned, like I know that I enjoy creating and craft, like I said, from that model, I enjoy, you know, visualizing abstract ideas, like the little hoot shoot. But I wanted to get to the point where I could visualize, you know, the world that I want to see. And I also just really enjoyed learning by doing. So if I wanted to learn something new, I felt like I had to do it. I didn't have to read it. I didn't have to hear someone talk about it. I had to go do it. So that kind of led me um, to going to grad school for industrial design. So I had to learn about, I wanted to learn about ID, so I had to go do it. But the first thing that I had learned from, you know, architecture is that I really needed to learn how to visualize things. So I immediately got into just creation and like creating. So I was trying to learn all the machines. I was trying to learn all the materials. So I was introduced to like the metal lathe went through a project where I had to create a pendulum, which is still unfinished because I made it so complex. But either way, this pendulum would spin like in three, like in a full circle. <laughs> and I just had a really large circle down here and a really small one here. And this is actually where the ball bearing was and it would just go in a full circle like a clock. So it was this really humongous installation, but even though it was unfinished, I learned how to use the metal lay, learned how to use the vertical mill. I learned how to grind metal. <laughs> I learned how to bore metal. And I learned how to like sketch to where I could actually manufacture and make something. And I thought that was really empowering. Um, after that, I wanted to like learn more about wood. So I made a pool toy um, in one of our studios and it had to have three different motions or three different, you know, mechanisms. So one was like its little head bobbing. The other was its legs walking. The other one was its feathers being like pulled up to like actually perch up. And I noticed over time, like, oh good, I'm getting better at sketching. Like, thank God I can actually draw what's coming to my mind. It just took some more time and some more practice. And it was helping me to learn even like how to use the CNC machine because this whole body was CNC through two different parts. Um, and then I went into wood again, but to combine both wood and metal in creating this bench for a mud room. So as you can see over time, my sketches got a bit more detailed, like exactly what was I using, like a one inch steel L channel? What was I going to screw into the wall? At what angle was this going to be? And like what you know, nut am I using? What steel rod, et cetera? And then I got to actually create it myself. So this is like Paduck wood. And this is me drilling into the side of it. And then me using like a vertical mill and finally not making my teacher do it for me. Um, so I just show these because I feel that it's important sometimes that even, there's, even though there's projects that you do that might not end up making it to your portfolio, I know that we always wanna have the best portfolio ever. Um, make sure you use projects to learn to grow your skill set, to learn what it is that you're interested in, learn, you know, basically just how to use these tools so that one day those tools aren't the things that are blocking you from like, you know, visualizing um, the design that you wanna make. And as designers, we have lots and lots of tools. Like, we're just never gonna stop having tools. <laughs> and I realized that <laughs> as well. So when I was creating this like um, water birth tub, I started getting interested in, um, water birth. I started getting interested in alternative methods of giving birth. Um, why? I can't remember why. I think I watched like a Netflix documentary on the business of being born. And I was like, oh God, I wouldn't want to give birth in a hospital now if they're watching this. So I was interested in that. And this was the first time where I was like, you know, I could decide on what project I wanted to make and why, which is why I really enjoyed grad school. Cause it's like, okay, no one's exactly telling me what I need to do. I'm making my own paths of inquiry. 
And so that's why grad school, I think, was really necessary for me because um, I had to move into that space of like learning and teaching myself. Mm -hmm. So I feel like for me in this project, what I learned a lot more about was literally SolidWorks and KeyShot <laughs> because I was not good at that for a while. And this is probably the best renderings I have, even though I'm still probably like I know how to use SolidWorks and KeyShot, but I wouldn't say it's the main tool that I love to use. Like for me, I realized sketching and prototyping are, you know, the areas of my design process that I'm going to use the most to communicate my ideas to myself or anyone. And then, you know, I can find an expert to do all this solid work stuff. <laughs> but that's what I learned through this water birth tub. And later it was like, okay, so I was interested in the water birth and alternative methods of giving birth. And now I'm interested in alternative methods of muscle recovery, because as you know, I was an athlete for a long period of time and I had issues with um, chronic hamstring injuries and those, their recurrence rate are like 33%. So if you tear your hamstring, like one in three times, you're probably gonna tear it again. And so I feel like no matter what sport you're doing, if you're running, you're like at risk for this. So I was interested in creating like a hamstring sleeve that had um, variable compression, that had heat actuation, and that had like a TENS unit in it so that no matter what you're doing all day, you can have this on and to work on, you know, work on healing your hamstring through those different methods. And it was fun because I got to actually finally work with textiles. And I even got to make some, um, some relationships with people in the College of Textiles who knew about um, some phase change materials called night and all. I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with night and all, but um, if you expose it to heat, it'll actually contract. So that was something I wanted to put within those textiles so that, okay, I don't have to double up my compression sleeve just to make it tighter. I can just add heat to it through some type of um, e-textile and be able to have it get tighter and tighter. And if I want it to be looser, I can pull it looser. So even here, I feel like now, like my sketching, I was pretty confident in it. And then it was more about like, how do I present that and show my sketches from like the first idea I had that might've not been used all the way to its progression to what actually got used. So again, went into rendering, but it was more difficult because what I tried to use ZBrush, I think for this. So textiles, I feel like don't have, um, well, not yet. They might not have the best software. I think back then there wasn't Clo 3D. Right now there's Clo 3D. And I think that's a much like more amazing software to use to model textiles in and apparel. But at the time I was using something called ZBrush, which I think is like more so for cartoon animation. Um, so this rendering isn't the greatest, <laughs> but I'm showing it either way <laughs> again, because I felt that this project really showed me, um, you know, doing something that's along with my passions and aligns with like something that's even happened to me, like within my life. So I hope that you guys are also finding some projects where you can kind of lead that inquiry. Like, what am I going to make? Why does it matter to me? And who else would it matter to? So Another question for you guys. I'm just wondering like, what are some projects where you feel like you prioritize like the learning over it being a portfolio piece? And I know for me, all the ones I just showed you guys were more about that learning. Like, let me learn how to use SolidWorks. Let me learn how to use um, KeyShot and let me learn how to use this ZBrush. Will I really use it later? I'm not sure, but to show and visualize what I have right now, like that's what I need. So I hope that if you guys have any areas where you feel like you're weak, you know, you find a project where you can kind of exercise that muscle. Or if you have an area where you feel like you're very strong at it and you just want to keep getting better at it, then just do that and like show that because your portfolio will end up being, you know, showing like your strengths. You're not going to be trying to show the portions where you're not that great at anyways. It's going to show what looks good. So go ahead and like build that out. But yeah. Um, not every project has to be a portfolio project. I mean, I've done so much stuff that I don't show. This is the first time I'm showing it. And I'm actually kind of nervous, but I hope you guys like it. Um, but yeah, feel free to answer this question in the chat. I'm going to keep going, but I'm definitely reading you guys' stuff. The hoot shoot is awesome. Makes me nostalgic for the Viewmaster. Oh, nostalgia. I'm about to look up the Viewmaster. I don't think I've seen that before. <laughs> um, so 
I feel like after all these years of like building up my skills, mind you, this timeline is on the side, but, and it looks like it's going by quick because it's a presentation, but in real life, this took me very, many, many years. <laughs> so it took my undergrad, which was four years. Um, I took a two year break because I was still trying to get a job with what I had and not trying to like change up. Didn't really get into architecture. And after those two years, went to grad school. So what, that's six years. Then grad school was three years. That's like nine years. Oh my God. Ugh. That just made me feel, <laughs> feel like, what am I doing? Oh my Lord. Either way, I hope y'all ahead of me, but either way, everyone's timeline is different and mine is a bit longer. So once I felt like I was very good or very confident in my sketching skill and confident in how I can present it, I feel like I finally got to a port project that I could put in my portfolio, like, oh, this is gonna impress somebody. And also it impresses me. <laughs> so this is one of those. Um, it was actually a baby bassinet project, which it's funny when we got it, I was like, what is this? Because of course at the time I didn't know, um, but basically the bassinets that are in the nurseries and hospitals, they needed a redesign. So we had a partner from UNC hospitals come and share with us why they needed to be redesigned. And it was because um, more hospitals are encouraging mothers to breastfeed now. And so that means that they're putting the, um, the babies in their bassinets in the same room as the mothers who are recovering from just giving birth as opposed to putting them all side by side in a nursery. So this like led to issues of like, well, how is the mom gonna pick up the baby after she's had a C-section? Or how's the mom gonna change the baby as she's had a C-section? Does the mom always have support? Is she a single mom? Is how does her nurse get there immediately when she presses the call button? And I'll tell you that is not the case because I broke my ankle two weeks ago and every time I had to go to the bathroom, I had to wait 30 minutes after I pressed the button for someone to come in and give me a bedpan. So, <laughs> You know, when your child is crying, you want to help them immediately, not 30 minutes later. So these sketches here were more so around the idea of, you know, how can a mother independently and safely, you know, bond with her child through breastfeeding, through changing it, um, and through just, you know, um, soothing it. And all these are different ideas about a fourth wall coming down, about the baby surface being hinged, and there being some storage for like diapers, um, a baby service that could swivel or even this little um, baby support area that could fall down to the side once you're with arm pressure. And again, I went back to the things that I knew that I was finally good at. Look, I knew I could visualize through making. So I made really, really small scale models like I would do back in architecture, <laughs> but I did it for a bassinet and looked at these different functions like swiveling the surface, a place to put storage, um, how to function a fourth wall, and also how the base could look. I want it to look stable or like a crib or something because cribs are very stable, they don't move. And this was kind of the final design. Again, just use the however good I got at Keyshot <laughs> and use this to kind of show what that final design might look like. But this is like a project that I feel like I show a lot in my portfolio because it has a lot more like design research associated with it. And I feel that people enjoy seeing um, like design through different methods, through drawing, through prototyping, through rendering. And all those are portions where if you're designing with someone like a client or someone who has a grant and wants you to create something for them, you can include them at each step of those processes. And that was what was able to happen for me here. Um, and after this, I realized I'd never done anything with UI or UX. So I tested that out when I was able to have a sponsored studio with Coca-Cola and they were looking like, they were asking us, what is the future of dairy? Um, and so for me, I thought that it was this, um, this smart packaging that could tell you when your milk is spoiled or when your milk is out. And once either of those things happens, it could just reorder it for you. So I thought that was interesting. So this was my little move milk package. And even though I still look and think I'm not the best at Keyshot, I feel like this is way, way better than the first thing I ever made in Keyshot. <laughs> so if you're ever wondering if you're making progress or not, I feel like it's kind of good to map out your history in a way, because right now I'm like showing you guys everything from like undergrad, the beginning of grad, 
just to even show myself that, oh, I'm still progressing. And as I continue to do, I continue to get better. So if there's ever an area where you don't feel like you're getting better, then just continue to do more. Um, and then going back to, again, being an athlete, like I got a internship at a startup called Fathom AI. And so this was very different from industrial design. For me, it was actually more about graphic design and trying to share with athletes how to use these different sensors. So Fathom AI made three different sensors that go on the inside of your foot, on the back of your hip, and also on the inside of your other foot. And basically um, have all these senses within them to understand how far you're running, even um, I guess if your ankle is uh, moving in or out, I forget what that word actually is, but there's a word for that. And how, um, I guess basically how that is going as you work out. So as you start to fatigue, is your ankle pushing in more? Or are you running slower? Or is your form deteriorating? And they would use those insights to help create a workout plan um, so you can help to prevent injury. So you start to know your habits as you get tired and know your habits and what areas of your body aren't as strong. So you can build those up so that when you do get tired, you still have better form. And this one I include more so just because it wasn't about a project about learning. It was really about um, me actually going into a new work environment because I'd never been in a startup before and I'd never worked in like a tech startup either. Also never done graphic design, but I learned a lot about visual communication through actually just having to do it. And that has increased like the quality of my presentations at work. It's increased the quality of my presentations talking to you guys and talking to people. And the same as I increased, my, increased the quality of me just sharing my designs and how I got um, where I'm at when it comes to sharing stuff with people who aren't designers, who care about the bottom line a bit more than maybe how it looks or what material it is. So my next question for you guys is just, what are some projects that have reflected your true interests and passions if you have had any? because if you haven't done any yet, I feel like that'll really, really change um, the designs that you put out. And I'm just looking at you guys' answers in the chat for the last question now, so. <laughs> yeah, every time I do a woodworking project, it's time to learn something new, yep. Luckily, wood is very forgiving. <laughs> um. And so now moving forward to like my thesis, um, what I decided was most important to me again was still sports at the end of the day, it was still sports. And it didn't matter if I was doing um, exactly industrial design, which in my head I had defined it as, you know, hard and soft goods. I decided to work on sports bras because no matter what, when I was a track athlete, I just had such difficulties with sports bras. <laughs> Um, and I did, I tried to work on them for the inclusive size market because I felt that all of the larger businesses were really looking at how to provide product for that market. So I felt if I was going to make anything from my portfolio and it was going to be authentic to me and my desires, it, it means it was going to surround athletics. It was going to be pointed towards, um, sports and like top brands like Nike or UA or Adidas or something. And it was gonna help me learn something new because those were the three things that I found throughout my history of projects that helped me to produce something that's really great. But going into this, I actually got pregnant like a month after <laughs> I started my thesis. And I was like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do this? <laughs> um, and I like was, con I was very conflicted because I was like, how am I gonna get a job before I leave? because that was one other thing I felt like I needed to correct from undergrad. I didn't get a job before I left undergrad, like, oh, okay, I need to do it now. But I didn't. And so that whole time I just worked on my project, I ended up graduating pregnant and I had my daughter back in June, which I was like, well, look at all those projects. I guess they were just foreshadowing me being pregnant as opposed to me working like <laughs> at some type of maternal, company of design consultancy is because I had to be pregnant. And fortunately from all those projects, I learned that I didn't even want to give birth in a hospital and I gave birth in a birth center, which is very cool for me. Um, 
But later I ended up getting um, like my dream job at Under Armour. So I presented to them my thesis, which was about sports bras. And that was the only project I showed. They didn't even care about all this other stuff I worked so hard to put together in my portfolio. They only cared about that one project and they hired me to be an assistant bra designer. So I feel like at the time I was definitely disqualifying myself because I was like, one, who wants to hire someone who's pregnant? <laughs> I had to go on maternity leave like immediately or who's gonna wanna hire someone with a child or like, why would they wanna hire an industrial designer to an apparel design role? All these questions that were kind of like disqualifying myself, you know, before even like trying to see what the answer could be. And so that's why my next question for you guys is like, was there any time that you felt unqualified for something? Um, but you can just put whatever that answer is in the chat because for me, it was definitely, um, it was definitely when I applied for the Under Armour job, I was like, I don't think I'm qualified for this. And the job was actually up for maybe, I think it might've been up for like a few months, maybe like four months, the job was just up there and no one had got hired. <laughs> and it was just sitting there. And I was like, well, I might as well go ahead and design it or uh, not design it, sorry, apply for it. Um, Cause I finally got desperate. And I was like, all right, I really need a job. I don't have one, my savings is running out. Let me just try this right here. Um, I say all this to say, like, I disqualified myself, but when I got to the, uh, I applied for it, they're actually really interested in my background, not being apparel and how much work I had done on my own to learn about bras, even to working with Haynes, because Haynes was in Winston-Salem at the time and um, NC State was in Raleigh. So I'll just drive down there. And one of my professors connected me with a coworker because she used to work there. And I got to work with their tech design team to even make prototypes. So I think like through that project, I showed them like my willingness to learn and like the initiative that I have. And also just another set of skills that are still transferable and still even bring value outside of just having like an apparel design degree. Um, but when I did get to that job, like I learned a bit more about, you know, confidence and how that comes over time. Um, if only I had like mapped out my projects like I did for you guys today, if I could like, you know, known to have some patience with myself, I was like, once I get there, I'm going to be designing everything. I'm going to show them all the things I can do. But I really realized that confidence grows like over time, because no matter what job you get to and whatever background you have, you have to learn the people around you. You have to learn their roles. You have to learn whatever the processes are, how people might choose to sketch or the vendors they work with. There's just a lot about how to work that you need to understand before you can uh, sometimes do the work. And for me, oops, sorry. I definitely had like a learning curve and like a lot of self doubt, but then I got like this horrible boss, like literally as bad as like the movie Horrible Bosses. <laughs> um, she didn't want to teach me. She didn't want to mentor me and at the time, I didn't realize that I was really dealing with a lot of like unconscious bias and racial bias and even like bias based on my age, which was interesting. So I went to HR a lot and I realized that unfortunately HR was not helping me out, but it did give me more of the language to realize what kind of situation I should be in. Cause you know, you might come to your first corporate job and it's different than startups, it's different than school because there's a cost, because there's stakeholders. But it doesn't mean that, you know, um, just because you're making some mistakes or learning that you're doing the wrong thing. Like when you're learning, you will have some ups and have some downs, but those should be, you know, seen as normal as opposed to like every time there's a down, you get punished for it. You should always have like a mentor when you get into like working. You should have someone who is um, okay with like reviewing your work and checking in with you, having touch bases. And once I realized that, and once I got really good at my job and realized, okay, I'm doing absolutely nothing wrong, but I'm still dealing with this BS, I applied for a new job <laughs> at Under Armour. And I finally got to actually work on like designing. But when I did that, I got, I realized how much of our job is not design <laughs> and how much of it is design. And I was like, man, what is going on? So at least for apparel, a lot of the job is making tech packs. Um, filling out bill of materials, 
creating presentations, the visual communication I was talking about, looking at lab dips because you know we get different colors every season and different fabrics. We have to make sure it's executing. And there's more than just fabrics in your clothing. There's like trim, like buttons or graphics and all those need to be cohesive and together and just tracking all those things, um, showing visualizations of consumer insights and sharing presentation decks. And it's all those things are definitely necessary, but all those things are also, you know, not designed. It's really just in support of your design. So there's a lot of work you have to do after you finally designed to prove to everyone why this thing matters so much. <laughs> um, so my question for you guys is, you know, has there been a time where you felt you were doing every, everything besides designing? And I know y'all probably in school, so I don't know if y'all have had um, some jobs yet, but I think it's still an interesting question to like figure out. Like I went to, I came here to design, but I feel like I'm doing everything but that, which doesn't mean, you know, your job isn't a designer, but a lot of the portions of it are like executing it and pushing it through to the end. So feel free to answer that within the chat. Hmm. Oh, my bad. So finally, two years later, because bras are on like a two year lead time, the first bra and project that I worked on when I got there finally came out, which is called the UA Infinity Bra. Um, Y'all should go buy it, it's online now. Um, but it just goes to show you that like, you know, in our world of instant gratification, design is definitely not that. <laughs> when you design something and you had to create it, it's going to take time. Everything has a lead time, whether it's a plastic project or a soft good or like a bra, um, it needs to be made. You're gonna have to get samples, give feedback to the vendor on what's wrong with it um, and keep going through that until it's correct. Then once you get those samples, we even we end up selling it to our accounts, especially if you do wholesale. If you see anything in Macy's or Kohl's, that's wholesale. But if you see it online, it's direct to consumer. Either way, this was um, a good time for me because it felt like at the time I was struggling so much with my manager, with my job. I ended up getting a new job. And then it was kind of nice to see like, wow, that two years of struggle really came to something that was really beautiful. So <laughs> one of those more full circle moments that you have to just appreciate. And that bra I felt was a really good link between industrial design and, um, and apparel design because we focused a lot on the pad and the pads are normally like laminated. So think of like gluing pieces of paper together, um, like laminating foam together is normally how you create a pad. But this bra was actually, or this pad was actually made like a plastic molded part. So it was um, PU injected, so polyurethane, sorry, polyurethane injected pad. And it had different depressions and perforations. And it actually became like our fastest drying pad that we'd ever put on the market, which is really great because um, sweat and breathability in the breast area, especially the under bust area is a big problem. So another kind of full circle moment that I wouldn't have expected, but I'm really glad I was able to be a part of that. Um, and then the pandemic hit, which we all know because we're here on Zoom now. And that changed a lot in the corporate world too and in my life. And same with um, the death of George Floyd or the murder of George Floyd, I should say. Those two things, I think coupled together really started changing the conversation and started changing even how um, I feel like corporations were looking at the diversity within their company and also like with who they had now, like what can we do with the people that we have now? And for me, it really just gave me a lot of opportunity to talk. Um, the first talk that I did was with advanced design and we just talked about diversity and design. design. So it was me, Kevin Bethune and Spencer Nugent, which I'm sure everyone knows because he's everyone's uh, virtual sketching teacher. And we got to talk about that. And after that, um, we did the Hue Design Summit, which I've been a part of for like five years now. But I think it got way more popular because people were looking for Black spaces and where Black designers are. And the Hue Design Summit is an annual 
unconference for Black designers that are in UI, UX, visual design, or industrial design. And so here, we hosted it virtually through Hopin, and this guy over here, Shay, is the CEO of Gravity Sketch. So again, me going back to my strengths and the things that I love about my design process, like how can I sketch in a new way? And sketching through virtual reality has become really big, I think, especially in the automotive industry, because you can collaborate and sketch together. And then what you create can actually be um, exported as an OBJ and you can actually create that part like 3D print it or make it manufacturable. So instead of going like to 2D to 3D to 2D to 3D again and again, you can just do it one time from the beginning. Um, but yeah, so the way that the pandemic had affected Under Armour was we had a large amount of layoffs, like 600 people globally. Um, and then obviously closing a lot of retail stores. And then we had a restructure, which means I thought in September, I thought I was going to lose my job. But instead of that, well, actually, let me go to this question. I thought I was going to lose my job. So what I was going to ask you guys, when has a wrench been thrown in your plans or your goals or your desires? because that has happened to many of us. And for me, the pandemic was one. It made me start working on my portfolio for sure. And that's why I was talking to a lot of people to say, let me do all these talks, let me speak, because I'm scared that <laughs> I'm not gonna have a job soon. <laughs> uh -oh. For some reason, I can't see my mouse. Oh, well, it's clicking at least. So anyways, Luckily, I didn't lose my job. I just got a third job at Under Armour. <laughs> and they moved me over to the men's training team where I'm designing like all men's training gear, base layer, shorts, pants, um, Project Rock, which is the Rocks line here. Um, so fortunately, I didn't lose my job, but it was interesting to move over to this different section. But what I did start getting was, again, lots of more opportunity even at my job. So I was tapped on to um, design our SS22 Black History Month collection. I was tapped on to work on like a design hackathon and present ways that we can make our full product creation process more inclusive. And it just seemed like I was getting a lot more opportunity when before, I guess I was just another number, I don't know. <laughs> but um, the largest thing I feel like came out of this was all these speaking engagements, because again, I think what I've shown you guys was how like design has helped me as a person, like find different parts of myself. And so this was another area of that for me. Like I was able to find kind of like my voice, like my perspective on design, what matters to me in design. And of course, diversity does. Of course, women in design does, but also just like elevating and seeing the projects that women in design are doing. So the, my favorite thing that I was a part of was the Black Design Ignite talk, where it was like 30 speakers, they each had to do a talk in five minutes about whatever project they wanted to. And I was able to see just like the wide range of creativity of black designers I'd never seen before. And it was nice because it seems like somehow when talking about black people, we always have to talk about racism. And after a while that just gets depressing. And I'd like to celebrate black people more like, oh, what is, what is this black person done? What have they created? What is this person doing right now? And so that event made me the most excited. And I hope to do more things like that, which is why when I was talking to you all day, I was just kind of sharing my story, my little history, um, projects that I've done, struggles that I've had just as a person, not even through the lens of, you know, being black. Um, but, you know, the things I'd like to leave you guys with is just, you know, bring your full identity to whatever space you're in, you know, school, work, wherever you're at. Hopefully you're at more places in school and work. Um, nurture your interests because I think those are the things that are gonna push you forward. Like if you're not interested in something, what's the point in like, you know, learning this software to make whatever you're doing. Like if you're interested in something, you'll go the extra mile. You'll go find that person, you'll go find that resource, you'll read that book, you'll make that drawing. Um, the third thing is, you know, fail forward. Like just change your perspective on things like if you feel like you're not doing well at something you know what am I learning from this what can I get from this you know your perspective will be the only thing to kind of push you through as opposed to like if you feel like you just failed then you'll just keep like going into a rabbit hole of like depression you'll never get out of it 
And then the fourth one is kind of map out your history, like map out where you've been, like your milestones, like what, what have I done that's good? Like, where am I at? And like my climb of this thing called life. And then just at the end of the day, just know that, you know, either you win or you learn, you're never losing. So me, I definitely felt like after undergrad that I lost a lot. And I felt that I was spending all this time just to be where my friends were at when they were 22. But now, you know, I couldn't be happier with where I'm at and what I'm doing. And I couldn't be happier than to like be here talking to you guys today.